Principles of surgery are fundamental to achieving successful outcomes in the operating room. These principles guide every step from preoperative planning to postoperative care, ensuring patient safety and optimal recovery. Critical care is essential for patients who are seriously ill or injured. It involves close, constant attention by a team of specially trained healthcare providers. This specialized care is crucial for stabilizing patients and managing complex medical conditions. Recognizing the critically ill surgical patient is a vital skill. Early identification of critical illness can significantly improve outcomes. It requires a keen eye and a deep understanding of the subtle signs and symptoms that indicate a patient is deteriorating. Signs that should ring alarm bells are numerous and varied, but they are crucial for early intervention. History. When a patient says, I feel like I'm going to die, it's important to take it seriously. Timor mortis, or the fear of dying, may accompany myocardial infarction, hypovolemic shock, or respiratory failure. Never ignore the patient who thinks they are dying. They are often right. Nurses. When an experienced nurse says, Mr. Smith just doesn't look right, it's essential to listen. Nurses quickly recognize the patterns of critical illness due to their extensive experience. General signs include hypothermia or hyperparexia, and sweating. Cardiovascular signs include decreased blood pressure, increased pulse, arrhythmias, and peripheral shutdown. Respiratory signs include tachypnoia and difficulty getting full sentences out. Renal signs include oliguria, which is less than half a milliliter per kilogram per hour. Gastrointestinal signs include new anorexia, nausea, and vomiting. Neurological signs include confusion, agitation or drowsiness, and fits. It may be obvious that a patient needs a critical care bed, for example, the patient needing ventilation, inotropes, or dialysis. But anticipating and maybe avoiding this is more difficult. The first step is recognizing compensated critical illness, such as shock compensated by tachycardia and peripheral shutdown or respiratory failure compensated by unsustainable respiratory efforts. Immediate management. First, identify and treat potentially life-threatening conditions. Then quantify the problem. This is important for referring patients to other clinicians and for establishing a baseline by which to guide treatment and monitor progress. Finally, start looking for the underlying problem. Some of these tasks overlap. Keep reassessing the patient and adjust your management. Quickly assess airway, breathing, and circulation. ALS algorithms are printed on the inside back cover. Management of shock is described on page 100 and management of hemorrhage is described on page 102. Sit the patient up and give high flow oxygen. Secure IV access and take blood for full blood count, urea and electrolytes, amylase, glucose, liver function tests, cardiac enzymes, clotting, group and save, and blood cultures. Take an arterial blood gas. Good oxygen saturations do not rule out respiratory failure, and arterial blood gases will also show acidosis and electrolyte abnormalities. Give 500 milliliters of gelafusine if the patient is not obviously fluid overloaded. Request a 12-lead ECG. Review drug, diabetic, and fluid balance charts. Perform a focused history and examination. Ask about symptoms that have changed recently and focus your examination on that. Review recent bloods and x-rays and request appropriate radiology. If the patient needs high dependency unit or intensive therapy unit, talk to your registrar or consultant. A patient may need to be discharged from high dependency unit or surgery may need to be postponed. Think ahead. High Dependency Unit. The HDU allows a level of care between ICU and the general ward. Invasive monitoring and inotropic support are routine, but ventilation and renal support are not. Nurse-to-patient ratio is 1 to 2. Patients with single organ failure requiring basic respiratory support, including non-invasive mask ventilation with CPAP, should be admitted to HDU. Guidelines for admission to HDU. Need for a monitored bed, need for invasive monitoring, need for inotropes, need for CPAP or other respiratory support, need for one to two nursing. The intensive care unit offers advanced ventilatory and inotropic support, renal replacement therapy, full invasive monitoring and one to one nursing care. Guidelines for admission to ITU, need for mechanical ventilation, 
failure of two or more organ systems, need for advanced monitoring, for example, a pulmonary artery catheter, need for escalating or additional inotropes, primary pathology should be reversible. Consultant involvement from both surgery and ITU is essential. Patient's stated or written preference against intensive care should be taken into account and documented. The surgical team should consider using critical care services for both elective and emergency surgical patients. Some guides follow. Is the elective patient in need of intensive infusional treatment prior to surgery, for example, IV anticoagulation or IV clotting factors? HDU. Has the patient undergone major surgery with significant transfusion requirements that might lead to hemodynamic and clotting abnormalities, for example, elective extensive pelvic surgery, aortic surgery, or extensive burn surgery, HDU? Is the patient over 80, having had major abdominal, thoracic, or limb surgery, HDU? Does the patient have known significant respiratory disease making intensive respiratory therapy likely, ITU? Would a patient due for emergency surgery benefit from aggressive, closely monitored fluid resuscitation prior to anesthesia? HDU. Does the post-op patient need infusional inotropic support, renal replacement therapy, or invasive monitoring? ITU or HDU. The golden rule is, if in doubt, ask for the advice of the critical care team. More patients can